Peace be with you. And welcome to Not Church. Not Church, at Not Church, we help deprogram some Christians through exploring Christian scripture with deconstruction and mysticism. No doctrine, no dogma, no Bravo Sierra. This is an ongoing public experiment in the public square. I speak mysticism with a Christian accent, but I'm no believer. Near death experience made me know that God is real and that God has no religion and that God is love and that God isn't even the right word. There is no right word. In my NDE, I was carried into union and saw that God has no religion and is far above religion, where only love, capital L, reigns. Don't let language trap you, except we needed to communicate. On the other side, capital O, other side of the veil, on the other side, every communication is telepathic right to your, my consciousness. No language. On the other side of the veil, we sometimes feel that resonance. From the other side of the veil, we sometimes feel that resonance, that direct mystical experience. And immediately after my first death, I found that all of my religious beliefs were erased from my brain. And I didn't need them, and I don't need them. I know who I am, where I am from, and to whom I belong, and to where I am going. Knowing isn't believing. All mystical experiences come with a, a small and powerful knowing. All of them do. Yours do. Mine do. We've talked about this in other videos. There's a great equality and the light inside us. Inside all of us, there's this radical equality. You are the same as me in the light, capital L, and I am equally the same as you. And this is true for everyone, for every dog and every chipmunk and every chickadee. There is a difference between those who see or want to see on this side of the veil and those who don't. And the only difference is that they don't see. It's, they're still the same as you and me. They just don't see the light the way that you do. That's the only difference. Those who don't are sometimes inclined to think that we who do are crazy, but we're not. So let's set a tone together this morning as we begin, as we always do, through OM chanting, vibrating in your chest and in your throat and in your third eye. Someone last week said after doing this, they felt it wide open. They felt the vibration open them up. And then let's settle into the internal chanting, focused on our breath, aiming our intent toward heaven, as we do in centering prayer practice. So let's start, begin here for a couple of minutes. Set the tone for the day. Close your eyes, please. Chant with me. silence and chanting and breath and focus.
crazy Jesus. From the Gospel of John. A certain kind of teaching talk by Jesus caused a heated controversy and debate in the wider community. A lot of people were saying, Jesus is crazy, a maniac, a demonic lunatic, completely out of his head. Why would anyone listen to a word he says? But others weren't so sure. They're not the ravings of a madman. Can lunatics open the blind's eyes? Was he crazy? Now, a lot of people thought so, from the Gospel of Mark. And when his family heard of his following, were th- and when his family heard of his following thronging a house where he went to eat dinner, they went out to grab him. For so many people were saying, Jesus, man, he's a lunatic. He's out of his mind. Jesus, he's crazy. That guy's insane. He's gone mad. He sounds like an egomaniac, a megalomaniac in the Gospel of John. Forty-five times in John, he makes outrageous claims with his I am this and I am that talk. I am bread. I am light. I am a door. I am resurrection. I am life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the vine. Me, 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 me. It can sound like a megalomaniac. Me, 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 me. Imagine if anyone you know talked like that. It would be egocentric, extreme self-centeredness. If Jesus was talking about his egoic mind, if he was talking about his egoic mind, it would be. Well, no wonder they all thought he was crazy. Look at the way he was behaving. Look at what he was saying. Instead, of course, we know this because we've talked about this. Instead, he was talking from his soul, from his mystical experiences, from the Christ consciousness, from the universal Christ, from the oversoul, from the divine self, from the creator, from the, the, the cosmic energy, from the light, whatever you want to call it. That light is and lives inside of all things here and now. And the chickadee, and the chipmunk, and in you and me. And it was in him. The difference was, of course, that he'd travel far and wide in the mystical realm. If it was Jesus speaking, then yes, he's a crazy man. But if he's speaking from his heart of hearts, from his soul, from his higher consciousness, from his Christ self, the universal Christ self, which is the same that's already in you and me, then he isn't crazy. Although that subtlety makes little difference to a rational atheist or to anyone who's never had a mystical experience. Even though the Gospel of John is not really historically accurate, (laughs) and that's being kind, its myths, its stories, can still tell us truth with a capital T. Jesus speaks out of his Christ consciousness, and that's typical of mystical experience. When he says, now listen, he says, I am the bread of life. He says that the I am, the oneness of being, the Elohim, the the divine source, the light, the energy, the I am is our spiritual food. We eat of the I am, and it gives us strength. You know this, you felt this. I am the light of the world. The I am is your inner light. How often did he say, you are the light of the world? The I am is the light of the world. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. The I am is the doorway. It's the opening. It's the sustenance. It's the light energy. It's the doorway. I am the resurrection and the life. 
the I am is the afterlife. It is the divine presence. It is the energy of all there is. It is the, the, the panentheism of the divine love inside of everything and beyond everything. I am the good shepherd. I am always sees and cares. The divine may know that you're in trouble, may see your, does see your suffering, does know that you are in trouble, and always sees and always cares. But that doesn't mean that it always fixes. It always gives light and love and life. But it always sees and always cares. And here's the most famous one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The I am is the path. It's the doorway. It's the energy, it's the sustenance, it's the path, it's the destination, it's the truth, it's the life, it's the light. It is all of these things. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The I am itself is the way, the truth, and the life. The isness is the way, the truth, and the life. It is the sustenance of our being. And when he was speaking like this, he was not talking about me, 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 me. He was talking about thou, 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 the divine self that is inside us, that is actually us at the core of our being. I am the true vine. I am the, the vine, the web that connects us, the, the connection to heaven. I am the vine that connects you to heaven. The I am is the vine, is the doorway, is the sustenance, is the living water, is the truth, is the life, is the way, is the resurrection. This I am makes him sound crazy. And those with ears to hear understand this because what he says resonates inside of us this vibration, this love, this peace. The true shepherd, the I am, walks right up to the gate of your heart. And because the gatekeeper is also the I am, I am the gatekeeper, I am the true shepherd, I am the gate. Because the gatekeeper is also the I am, then the I am opens the gate and lets the I am in. All of these things are the I am. All of these things are the divine self. All of these things, he says. And the sheep recognize the true voice of the shepherd, of the true shepherd. You know, you hear, when, you, when this resonates inside you, when you feel the divine presence, you need no explanation. When I was dead, it was self-evident that God was God, the divine was the divine, the, the living energy of all creation was the living energy of all creation. And when you feel this resonance inside of you, when you have an awakening and a realization of the divine presence, you know this for truth, not because I tell you, or because you read it in some book somewhere, or because somebody told you it's so, but because you feel it inside the resonance of yourself. The sheep also know the I am, for the I am calls them by their true names. And you know that I was called by my true name when I was dead that can't be pronounced, that can't be said, that my name Peter is not my name. How many names have people called me in my life? Peter, Petey, Pete, Cephas, Stone, Rock, Peter Pan, other bad names too. And not one of those names is me. They're not my name. Your name really isn't your name either. It's the one you go by here. But when you hear the divine self calling, your true name, that's when you feel this resonance inside yourself. And it leads them out of the darkness. It leads you out of the darkness. For they belong to the I am and follow the I am. For we, the sheep, when we hear this divine spoken inside of us, we know we belong to it and it is us and we are it and we follow it. The isness, 
the resonance. For the sheep, they're familiar with the voice of the shepherd because they hear it with the ear of their soul. The ear of your soul hears this cosmic resonance, this frequency, this presence, this doorway, this path, this strength, this food, this sustenance. To enter through the I am is to experience life, freedom, and satisfaction. To enter into the gate, through the gate, is to experience these things. The I am alone is the good shepherd, he says. That's true. Only the light is the light, by any name you want to call it. There is only this one unity, and it is itself, and it is the good unity, the good love, the good shepherd, the good door, the good path. And I know those whose hearts are mine, he says, for they recognize me and know me, he says. And you know this I am when it speaks inside of you, and your heart knows the heart of the divine when it speaks inside of you. And no one needs to tell you that it was the light itself. Just as my maker knows my heart, and I know my maker's heart, he says. There is one flock, one I am, for all who recognize the voice of the I am, the universal Christ consciousness, by one name. The I am joins us to one flock around the world, and I think across the universe, where they've never heard the name of Jesus. They don't even have our DNA. They're not even human beings. But this divine light, I dare say, is everywhere there is anything. And if they know these off-world creatures, intelligence, unhuman, if they know the light, then they know the I am hiding in all things. How do we know this? We don't except for that we know it among ourselves, and we see it in chickadees and, and trees and each other. Now, are those the ravings of a madman who taught love? Some thought so. His family thought so. Definitely the wider community debated it. Is this guy crazy? I think he's insane. Mystical experiences of all kinds sound loony when we say them aloud. You know this. That's why we have Mystic Tea Salon as a free and safe place to talk about this, because people who don't have them don't understand. But that doesn't mean that they're not absolutely real. They are absolutely real. They called him crazy. And isn't that what many of us fear? If we tell our stories of transcendence to our families, friends, neighbors, or our peers, they might think that we've lost our minds. I know that some of my neighbors think that of me. I'm not quite like you, one fellow said to me this morning. I said, no, no, you are like me. No, he said, I'm not. Okay, I caught your meaning. Mystic Tea Salon is designed as a safe place to talk and to discover that you and your mystical experience, your spiritually transformative experience, you're not alone. We're not alone. I think I told you the little story about how I had what could be called a Kundalini awakening, could be called a descent of the Holy Spirit, how I was on the side of a road treating to a car accident victim and the light exploded inside me eliminating all sense of myself this is after my nde and flashed and pulsed through me eliminating me and i could only recognize that it had been there after it had left and when it was in me it was just full illumination out to the extent of my skin and beyond 
And then when this whole experience was over, it left me wrecked. I was a mess for three days. Every time I closed my eyes, I was inside the angel of light, my angel of light, my friend, the intellect carrying me at an incredible rate across the universe. Every time I closed my eyes, I was not in this world for three days. No wonder my friends and family thought I had gone crazy because they'd never experienced such a thing. No wonder they thought Jesus was nuts. That's the risk we take when we talk out loud. But the more of us that speak of it, the more normalized it becomes. I spoke at the IANS conference over the weekend, and on, thir- on Friday night, I listened to Marjorie Woolacott, Dr. Marjorie Woolacott, 40 years of research at IANS, talk about 45% through a study, 45% of respondents experienced an afterlife communication, an after death, I'm sorry, an after death communication, ADC, 45%. This lines up with the 50% that I saw in churches around New England when I was preaching and asking, raise your hand if you've ever had an after death communication, a visitation from a beloved dead one. She now has figures for this, 45%. And how many of us have mystical experiences that we are not willing to talk about because nobody wants to be crazy? Jesus, he was insane, they said. People said he was crazy. Why would you listen to anything that guy said? It's a risk to come out and talk about it. That's what we have Mystic Tea Salon for. I didn't expect you to go out and talk about it in public, to shout it from the rooftops, Jesus came to visit me. I had an out-of-body experience. I died. Whatever your story is that was spiritually transformative, you don't have to stand up on a rooftop to shout it. But please tell somebody. You might be surprised. You've got a 50-50 chance chance that they will say, Me too. I had one too. And then you find a compadre a companion on the journey could be sitting right next to you right now. Was Jesus insane? People said so. I don't think so. I think when you have a divine mystical experience of an advanced nature, you come back a different person. I did. Every single one of these mystical experiences is a complete shattering. It was a shattering for me anyway, a shattering of myself every single one of them, and I've had dozens of them. I come back a new person every time. And everybody thinks I'm the same guy. I look like the same guy. Of course, I'm I'm aging, got little wrinkles here and less hair there. So they see that, but they still think I'm the same guy, but I'm not. My interior world is transformed. My perspective shifts every single time. This was true for Jesus. It's true for you. If you've had a spiritually transformative experience, you've been transformed. You've been changed by it. And what you say about it, because it is ineffable and unspeakable, open you up to judgment of others. The thing is, There's so many of us, half the population, just under half the population, who's afraid to talk about it. Can you be brave enough to talk about it to somebody? Now, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this in the the comments. Tell me if you've ever told anybody. Tell me if you're afraid to tell somebody and why. Tell me if you like the term that I've used this morning, the universal Christ consciousness in the comments, and if you don't like it. Or whatever words you like to use. Maybe you like to use numinous consciousness or liminal energy. I'd like to begin a public conversation. We need to talk about this. You, my friend, and your mystical experience, you're no more crazy than Jesus was. You're no more insane than him. 
It reminds me of Meister, not Meister Eckhart, but Thomas Merton. After Adolf Eichmann, the famous Nazi, was brought to trial at the Nuremberg trials. And the Nuremberg trials, they judged him, they judged uh, Adolf Eichmann sane. They judged him sane. And Merton's comment was, if that's sanity, then I am insane. Well, that's kind of how I see the world. My divine nature, the light that I know that I am, this is sanity with a capital S. It's the egoic mind, the me, 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 me that is insanity. It's the egoic, egocentric mind that misperceives the beauty inside ourselves and inside others. You're not crazy. You're not. It's the world that is. Aim your heart at the oneness of being. Find your strength, your sustenance, your path, your doorway, your gate, your truth, your way, and your life right there. Right there inside yourself. And you don't need me. And you don't need Jesus. But you do need the I am. You need the light. What's crazier than a person going around saying, love your neighbor as yourself and love God above all things? What's crazier than that? What's crazier than saying love is the one thing that matters? <laughs> there are lots of things crazier than that. I want to thank everybody here for being here with me this morning. I want to thank especially um, Connie and Primary Feathers for making a gift this morning. I appreciate the super chat a lot. And if you have a question, it's easy for me to see it on a super chat, but also thank you just for your support. Because, And thank you, Kristen, because I'm doing this for you. I'm trying to bind us, create, find my community. I want to show that this is not insanity. That love is the norm. It's normal to have a spiritually transformative experience. It's the opposite of insanity. And I want to thank you people who support me on Patreon or on PayPal. Your gifts make it possible for me to continue doing this week to week because otherwise I got to get a job. I don't have a trust fund. And I appreciate your being here and supporting me. Because really what I am actually trying to do is to help create an egalitarian community that is crowd-sourced. Mysticism is crowd-sourced. That's what the salon is all about. A place for safety and conversation. So that we can find the strength inside ourselves to be actually who we actually really truly are. And if you need a specialist to talk about your spiritually transformative experience, your near-death experience, your NDE, if you need help, need help integrating or understanding, I'm your guy. Book a, sign, book a time with me. Mystic Tea Salon is coming up in the next hour, and you can find that link bump, bump, right below. And I want to give you a pebble for your pocket today. Here's a pebble for your pocket. Mystical experience is sanity in an insane world. Thanks for joining me here this morning. Peace and love to all of you. I'm going to go back through and see if there's any questions. If you had a question you asked a couple of minutes ago in the chat, why don't you pop it up there again so that I can take a look at it and I'll, I'll see what's going on in the chat. Thanks for being here this morning, everybody. And thanks for joining me yesterday at IANS. Um, it was a, an excellent, an excellent opportunity for all of us to gather together. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lusa, Lucia, rather, and, and T-Barb, and Nancy, and Stardust for all your help this morning. 
Um, I love that you're laughing. I love to be, I like being funny. I like laughter. Uh, thank you, Primary Feathers. And thank you, Connie. And I'm scrolling back. Um, we're a community of crazies. Well, that's what they say. <laughs> that's what they say. That's what they said about him. A lot of people who haven't had an NDE are starting to realize the truth. Bless those who have not seen but believed. Amen to that. That's the famous Thomas quote at the end of the gospel there. Believing, believing is the beginning. It's the opening. Wonderful you spoke there. Thank you. Uh, right, I do understand. Thank you, Cynthia. I do understand that feeling. I am better now, though, Connie said. Gee, it's late for you, Primary Feathers. I'm glad you're here, too. T-Barb, if I had an NDE, I'd definitely be shouting it out and telling everybody. That, yes, I mean, I, 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 the second time I had a near-death experience in 2015, that's the very first thing I did in from my hospital bed with my family in my room as I woke up and they're all gathered. They're like, how are you feeling? I said, well, I died yesterday again. I had another near-death experience. And so immediately I spoke about it. You know, but in 1980, I kept my mouth shut for 20 years because back in though back in the old days back in the old days we didn't talk about such crazy things because it was crazy but now of course i agree with you and i did the same t-barb as soon as i had a second one i talked about it and i hope that i hope you don't have one because i don't wish this on anybody it's a lot harder than people think but but i do thank you for for volunteering to be vocal about it immediately and, and, and thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Neil. N uh, Niall Ohm. Peter, I would like to be able to learn how to connect with my higher self a bit like experiencing something like an NDE without actually having one. Can you help me with this? I believe I can. I, I believe I can do that for you. I can help you with that. So yes, I look forward to seeing you there. Angel, thank you for the super chat. I'm going to scroll back up again to uh, wherever I left off there. Do, 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 do. That's, that's, that's background music. Do, 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 do. Um, Lucia. Hi there from Australia. Good to see you here. Um, yes, I have. And it was liberating, says Connie, especially because they did believe me. But even if they didn't, it was okay. That's kind of where I'm at now. And my second near-death experience launched me into that. I mean, I, I was coming out as a near-death experiencer in the, as a, like a national person when I was in my hospital bed recovering from my heart attack in which I died, I was, my book was coming out and, um, I realized it doesn't matter if they believe me or they don't believe me. I've never really cared if anybody believed me. That wasn't my problem. My problem was I needed to maintain my credibility in the world in order to have a job to earn money. You can't be a congregational minister and everybody think you're crazy. You, you don't, I mean, it was hard enough as it was. The terrible things happened when I, when the churches I was in, I didn't cause them, but terrible things happened and I had to deal with them and I needed credibility and I needed respect in order to do that. And now, but that things are different now. It doesn't, I, I never really cared if anybody believed me. I just didn't want, I, I like, well, let me put it this way. I've never tried to convince anybody that what I'm saying is true. I don't, you're going to find out on your own the moment you die. And that's totally fine with me. I got nothing to prove here. Uh, that's where I'm at with all of that. Uh, you're welcome, Connie. Lightworkers says Barb. Yes, says Barb. Uh, Carmen says, we are all helping to expand the collective human consciousness. When we do speak up and talk about our experiences, we are, we are a community. This whole thing is a decentralization of the power of religion. It's inside of each individual heart. Trisha Barker was talking about this yesterday at IANS. It's the community. It's not about self. I've said this a million times. It's not about me. It's never been about me. It's only about the light itself, and it's in you. It's really about you. It's about all of us. This is a decentralized phenomenon of the divine light living that needs no explanation and needs no words to be experienced, nor even understanding, nor knowledge. It just needs to be experienced. And it's inside of all of us. 
It's a great revolution. The light inside every single one. It's a collective human thing. Love and light is the only sanity in the world, and it is the only thing that is trustworthy, says Sharon. It's the only thing that's real. It's the only thing that's lasting. It's the only thing that's eternal. All other things are just things, and all things pass away. And Jesus was saying, this world will pass away. Of course it'll pass away. Every molecule passes away. No, that's not true. Every living thing passes away. And eventually planets pass away too, and even stars, and even galaxies, they pass away too. Everything passes away. Everything that is a thing. Source, says Barb. You say source. That's a good word too. I tell people a lot. I don't get it. What I found is even people I know who are spiritual or claim to be, even they don't get it. But some really do, says Rachel. Yeah. Some say they do, but don't. And you can always tell the difference. It takes it takes one to know one. It, like sees like. It, that's just the way it is. If you see, I got a little, somebody's biting me behind my ear. A little black fly. Sent it on to its next incarnation. Um, just then. Right in front of your eyes. Squish. Um, yeah, people don't. People, some people who are spiritual people don't understand. They just think they do. And that's fine. They're going to find out too. But it takes one to know one. That's really how it works. And I wish it wasn't so, but it is. Um, I'm going to make sure I don't miss anybody who is kind enough. To, thank you, Ashley. Also, hello from Florida. Thank you for the super chat. Going back, scrolling back up to where I was. Where was I? I can't tell. I cannot not tell someone because I was taught to talk about my feelings. I am no, I no longer care what others think of me, even my closest friends. I know I can let all of them go if needed. So Cynthia, amen to that sister. That's kind of where I'm at too. I think, I think that the 45% of us that uh, Marjorie Willicott measured on just that one thing after death, after death communication, not excluding all the other kinds of mystical experiences and spiritually transformative experiences that people have. I, I don't need my friends to have those experiences. And if they want to stay being friends with me, that's fine. If they don't, I can't change who I am. I don't want to change who I am. I am part of the light and I'm good with that. And I've lost friends. It's okay. I still love them, but you know, they'll find out. There is only love. Practice it every day, says David. Amen. Barb, it's joyful. Cynthia, thank you. Great to be with you. So, so glad that you're here. Sorry you missed me at IANS. They recorded it. Um, I think that there's a fee to, to buy into the conference, um, but it's available if you want to hear it. And all the other great speakers, some really good science that happened uh, yesterday and uh, probably today too and the day before. Uh, it's crazy laughter, LOA. <laughs> Did you know Crazy Eddie in New York? Back in the 80s, back when New York was super dangerous and dark and dank, and ugh, there was this guy called Crazy Eddie, and he had commercials. I'm Crazy Eddie. My prices are insane. And it turns out he was. He actually was crazy, uh, and he made it work for him financially in his business, but eventually it didn't work out so well for Crazy Eddie. That's where that came from for me. I stole it from Crazy Eddie. Um, thanks, Peter. Happy weekend, Christine, to you too. Um, let's see. My OBE was about 1980 since Cynthia. It, it just takes one out-of-body experience to make you realize, oh, that thing down there is not me. This is me. That's me? No. It only takes one. Just takes one. Connie, no, in 1997, I did not talk about it. I told one person, a social worker, and she looked at me with a blank stare. I didn't know what to say. Doctors, healthcare workers, you get a lot of blank stares from them too, but not everybody. Things are changing, but yeah, the blank stare, they have no idea what to do with it. And if, not, if nothing tells you to teaches you to keep your mouth shut, that's the thing that teaches you to help keep your mouth shut is when somebody like, oh, 
I there the bubble above their head says, Oh, I didn't realize you were crazy, but their face is blank. Ah, <sighs> yeah. Kristen have told before. I think others have no way to respond. How do you respond when you have when you hear someone say they've had a mystical experience? Now, Kristen, you're right. You are a hundred percent right. They have no way to respond. They don't know. So blessings on them and thanks for bringing that up because it's not their fault. It's not their fault that they can't see what we see. They didn't make it happen to themselves. We didn't even make it happen to ourselves. So no wonder they give the blank stare because they don't know how to respond. I've been, imagine, I remember the first time I told somebody I went to heaven when I died. They're all like, you don't look dead to me. Blank stare. But you're right, Kristen. They don't know how to respond. And we have to have humility and compassion for them. And just let them be where they are. Not try to force them because you can't. Have compassion for them and be humble with them. And I thank you, Kristen, for bringing that up because that is important. Primary feathers. When surrounded by people who are too burdened to question the way things are, I sometimes forget to stay in the light. You and beings like you remind me that I am not alone. I had a little struggle staying in the light this morning myself. There was an incident in my neighborhood with a dog and some neighbors, and um, one of the neighbors came over, and uh, I was trying to help. And this neighbor was kind of upset this morning. And and uh, and as this person got more and more upset, I found myself um, digging deeper into myself. To oh, where's that shred of peace? That where's that piece inside me? Where it, where did it go? And eventually, I found this little thread of piece, and I kind of pulled that thing right up. Oh, 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 oh and piled it into my belly. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to maintain. It is, and that's why you got to continue with a meditation practice. You got to continue in a collective, in a community of people like you, so that you can strengthen yourself and give yourself the bread of life. We share the bread of life with each other. But yeah, yeah, sometimes it's hard. Only because if they don't believe you, it doesn't change your experience. You still had it. That's right. Believe it or not, it doesn't change what happened to me. That is true. And Connie said so, and she's right. Um, Alfred, do you consider the Gospel of John as far more mystical than the other canonized Gospels? Yes, it is. It's far more mystical. It's also more anti-Semitic. It's both of those things. And the Gospel of John was written 100 years later, and it's very likely that those were mm, not exactly quotes of Jesus, but they were thoughts in the school, the Johannine school that summarized his more mystical teachings. Right? And it doesn't matter if they're historical or not, if they're telling forth mythologically a truth. But it is also the most anti-Semitic Gospel of all of them. Because by that point, Christianity had developed, Christianity wasn't, a, Jesus, Jesus wasn't starting a religion, okay? And, and he was proclaiming love and light. And then a religion about Jesus started inside of Judaism. And then over the next hundred years or so, it, it, Jude, this, this sect of Judaism spread to the Gentiles and then the division rose between the two camps and the dominant group the gentiles started to think that the uh, jewish people were wrong and they said so no they weren't wrong any more than the christians were right the light is the light is the light but definitely the gospel of john is the most mystical and the most anti-semitic there you have it um where were we? I lost my place. Can I find my place? Maybe. There we are. Last spring, I had a major emergency surgery, says Stardust. I was telling some stories to the hospital pastor, and it was received with great politeness. Well, that's good. At least, at least the, the chaplain received it with great politeness. Of course, hospital chaplains are trained to do that. 
they're trained. Okay, so if you get a, a Protestant hospital uh, chaplain who goes in to visit uh, a Wiccan, the hospital chaplain has to allow space for the Wiccan to be who she or he is. That's the role of the hospital chaplain. So I'm glad to hear that there was great politeness because that matters. I'm glad that you told that chap, that pastor, that hospital pastor. Uh, my church is back, is my backyard and within me, says Barb. Yeah, my church is kind of my nature too outside. Church is nature. Nature is church for me. Yep, I'm with you. Primary feathers. Peter, religious institutions soon corrupt themselves. Absolute power coops, corrupts absolutely. Power corrupts. It's the way it is. I worked for several, and their main interest was in appearances, building, and grounds, and status. You did work in a church. <laughs> okay, I just so that everybody knows, this is, the, this is the inside scoop of church life. The main interest is often appearances, buildings, and grounds, and status. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No offense to those people that's filled with a lot of good people, people who mean well, people who try to do well, people who try to do good. But definitely how it looks matters most to a lot of them. And the, the church I used to serve here in my town, it's beautiful. They've taken extraordinary care of this building. It's beautiful. It's welcoming. Uh, the gardens are gorgeous. The parking lot is now paved and it's, it's fabulous. Uh, it's, it looks good. They did a great job on the grounds and the building, and they've built a fine community center that does a lot of good in the town. It, it does, and they're full of good people, and I know most of them, or at least half of them anyway, but that's really what they're interested in. They, they weren't really so much interested in mysticism and the divine truth of self, and that's fine. That's fine. It's okay. They can be where they are. Uh, Sean, I've never had an NDE, but I've been trying to teach myself how to have a self-initiated OEB. Any hints of how to make this happen? So, no, <laughs> I don't know how to leave my body purposefully. I've purposefully not learned how to leave my body on purpose. I, I practice the self-elimination of my egoic mind, my false self, and allow the divine grace to pluck me as the will of the isness is. Uh, other people might be able to tell you techniques on how to purposefully leave your body. It's not something I've ever pursued. I'm much more interested in a, a higher form of spirituality, the union itself. That's what I want. That's what I pursue. You can pursue that if you want to. That's good too. It's not bad. It's just, it's good too. It's just not what I'm after. And so I don't know how to do it because I haven't studied it. And I wish that I could help you, but I don't know how. But what I do know how to do is empty oneself and allow more room for the divine presence to enter into you and flow through you and impact your life and change your world from the inside out. That I do know. Um, wish I could help you with that. There are others who can, I'm sure. Let's see, where was I? My doctor rolled her eyes when I spoke of seeing spirits. She did, did she? <laughs> yeah, of course, that's, yeah. I guess the rule, the lesson there is, if she rolls her eyes, don't bring it up again. <laughs> she probably won't forget, though. Don't let it bother you, Sharon. Yes, she's right. Don't let it bother you, says Connie. That's just the way it is. Lots of eye rolling, especially in the medical profession. Profession, scientists, medics, and doctors are indoctrinated to be materialists, reductionists, and skeptics. This is true, and that actually helps them be doctors. They're better doctors when they're materialistic, reductionist, and skeptics, because then they 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 are honing in on the analysis of the evidence in front of them. I mean, it's 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 helpful for them as professionals. But they could also choose to develop other parts of themselves too. I've, I've, I've grown my own sort of skepticism and my own sort of reductionism and materialism also. I mean, I, I like when someone came to me a week ago and said that a light had illuminated in her room 
underneath her desk and she thought it was a sign from God. I asked her if their modem was under there and it turned out it was. Now, maybe a spirit interfered with that and made the modem light come on. I don't know. But the fact that there was a modem underneath it and there's lights on a modem made me a little skeptical. But maybe a spirit came in and illuminated. I don't know because I wasn't there. It's possible because, you know, ghosts, disembodied human beings interfere with electronics. I just don't know. And so I can't say I know when I don't. And that's kind of what doctors do. They, they can't say they know when they don't. And that's good for us, for our health, for the most part. Wait until it happens to the doctor. Yeah, that's right. It can happen. That's what happened in uh, Marjorie Willicott. She was a skeptic when she was going into this. Her research, she's like, this is interesting, but I don't believe in any of this stuff. And then she had a, a, an awakening at a, at a retreat with, uh, I want to say, uh, one of the Maharishis, I can't, I don't want to say which one because I don't remember, but she had an awakening and that changed everything for her. It only took one experience for her to realize to have a fully transformative experience and turn her life around. And she went from skeptic to experiencer. She still kept her reductionist um, analytical mind to do her research because she's a scientist after all, and that's important. But yeah, it just takes one. That doctor, maybe someday the doctor will have an experience and the doctor will be like, I remember that woman told me this and I didn't believe her. Oh my God, now I do. No woo-woo stuff allowed in the universities. <laughs> yeah, I kept my mouth shut in the university too. Uh, maybe some pastors have had NDEs like me. Connie says, yes, I think Howard Storm, he's one. But for the most part, the pastors I know, I don't know any. I'm the only I'm the only one I know, except for Howard Storm. There's probably others, but they've not talked to me about it. I have met other mystical experiencers for sure. One or two here, right here in the state of Maine. And I'm going to be talking to them. I'll be talking to a conference of United Church of Christ clergy and lay people. I, strangely, I've been invited to speak at their annual meeting in in Maine this year after being the bad boy, um, <laughs> I'm still I'm st still under threat of getting kicked out. I haven't quite got kicked out. It's Anyway, I'll leave that aside. Um, where were we? We only got a couple of minutes left here. It's uh, 53, 10.53, and I've got 11 o'clock, top of the hour in Mystic Tea Salon, and that is linked down below. Um, you're welcome, Alfred. In Tennessee, my sister actually attends a Baptist church where the pastor keeps telling people, the church is not this building. You are the church. This is totally true. You're, that Baptist pastor is right. And they're like, the, the people in the church are like, no, 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 I'm pretty sure this is the church. And he's like, no, you're the church. And they're like, no, I'm pretty sure the building is. <laughs> That's a pretty common thing in churches. People don't grasp the thing that the temple of the heart is the placement of God inside us. That's where it lives. And between us and among us and around us and underneath us and everywhere else. Well, that's where they are in their journey. No one can change that, says Connie. That's totally true. There are plenty of books about leaving your body. Just look up astral projection, says Angel Farthing. Yes, look it up. If Googled online, one might find a Russian teacher teaching astral projection out of California. The online three-day course is free but intense, and I wish I knew his name. I have the opinion that there are special angels who work through doctors and surgeons. Just talk to Trisha Barker and read her book, Angels in the OR. Angels worked through her surgical team and her car wreck, after her car wreck. All right, my friends, I only have a few minutes left. I'm going to go down a couple more of these, and then i got to take a little break before uh, Mystic Tea Salon. So one more minute or so. I've watched... Every podcast I could find on you for the last two days, Peter. Oh, Linda, um, I recommend you to others. You're so appreciated, Peter. Thank you, Linda. You're going to make me blush. Got it out, but thank you. Um, I have watched, oh, yeah, you said that. Uh, I have spontaneous OEBs for 35 years on average, once every couple of months. Couldn't tell you why, but I've had to. In I've tried to induce them, and you can by natural beats. You can. Thank you, Christine. Maybe you and uh, maybe you could talk to each other. 
It's almost 11. Thanks, Ellen. Yeah, I got to go. Everybody, peace and love to you all. Um, thank you for being here. Thanks for the super chats. You made this a wonderful Sunday for me because it turned, it, it's been fun. I love having fun with you, but I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. Peace and love. I'll see you at Mystic Tea Salon. Peace and love to everybody. Thank you. See you next Sunday. See you next Sunday. I got an idea for next Sunday, but I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. Peace.